Beloved congregation, I invite you to turn with me again to Romans chapter 3. And I'd like to read verses 1 and 1 and 2. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This is page 1735 in the Pew Bible. The Apostle Paul writes this. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Dear young people, what is the point of your baptism? Isn't that something that you wrestle with from time to time? I mean, teenagers are practical people in the sense that you always want to know what is the point of doing something. Isn't that right? I mean, just for example, think about school. It, I know it's still summer. It won't hurt. We won't think about it for that long. But think about school. And one of the most constant things that you my young friend, are always asking is this, why are we even learning this? Right? And, and we can all picture you right now rolling your eyes into the back of your head as you say it. The big sigh, what's the point of learning this? How is this relevant? I'll never use it again in my life. And so you see, this is where your brain often goes. What's the point? And that's actually a good question. It's worth asking as long as you are humble and willing to admit that you don't have life all figured out yet. And so maybe your parents and teachers aren't just tyrants who love torturing you by having you learn useless things simply because they enjoy watching you suffer. No, you can ask that question, what's the point, but be humble enough to realize it's more likely that their life experience has taught them the value of learning in general, the discipline of that, but also maybe even the value of learning this particular topic specifically. And so humility asks that question, what's the point? I want to know the value of this, but it also is teachable. It's humble. And as your pastor, dear young people, I want you then to be asking that question about your baptism. Please ask it. Internally, externally, voice it to me if you like. What's the point of my baptism? Young friends and older ones as well, are you asking that question? Because don't you care to know the answer? I mean, sometimes we feel like we can't ask questions because somehow it's not acceptable, and yet really the opposite is true. If you aren't asking that question, then you're probably not even thinking about why God had you baptized in the first place. And that's a much more serious problem, to have received this great gift and not even bother to think about it to get the gift and not even ask the giver, what's this for? What's the point? How do I use it? So please ask. It's not just me who says that. God actually says that. Uh, this is illustrated for us in Exodus 12. You don't need to turn there, but let me just remind you of Exodus 12, uh, verses 26 and 27. God has just instituted the Passover. This memorial feast to celebrate throughout their generations and notice this, God doesn't want them to go through the motions without thinking about it. So Exodus 12, verse 26, when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? Uh, why are we doing this? What's the point? You see, kids weren't that different back then. Uh, what do you mean by all this? Then God says, you shall say, it's the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. God wants us to be asking. He wants us to be thinking because he wants us to be knowing the meaning of these things. 
And so with that in mind, we are considering that section in our baptism form, which I already mentioned to us. It speaks about circumcision and baptism. The last couple baptism sermons, we saw how God has included the children of believers in his covenant of grace in Abram's day. And so children, that means the father has drawn you into the warmth of the covenant and included you into his visible church. We're not going to go into that now. We covered that the last few sermons. You can go back and listen to those. But our point this afternoon is to take the next step. To look at the gift that the good father has given to us once we are included in the covenant and included in the church, namely baptism, and to ask, what's the point? Why would God command that believing Abraham have his infant child circumcised? And for us in the new covenant, why does he want our infant children baptized? And so our title is The True Value of Baptism, and we have two points. The true value of baptism, asking that question, what is the point or what is the meaning? What's the value? The true value of baptism, our first point is the problem. The problem. And here I want to start with a very serious problem. And it's a problem that comes to us from this text. Very plainly, very clearly, it just jumps off the page of Romans 2. And the problem is this, that we can use good God-given gifts like Old Testament circumcision for the Jew or New Testament baptism for the Christian. We can use good God-given gifts in such a way that actually cuts us off from God's eternal favor. That's a serious problem. And we don't want to make that mistake. As we'll see, these good gifts were actually given to help us enjoy. Enjoy God, the fountain of all good. Enjoy his favor eternally. But what I'm saying here from this text, we see we can actually use those good gifts to do the opposite, to cut us off from the enjoyment of God. Now, Paul here shows us how that is possible in our text. And in this section, he's counseling someone who has actually fallen into that deadly error. Uh, If you were with us this morning, then we noted the context is that of God, the just judge judging all unrighteousness. So if you weren't here, that's no problem. Let me just summarize it for you. Romans 1, Paul exposes the unrighteousness of the world. And that's a problem because God is a just judge. But then here in Romans 2, Paul has been exposing the unrighteousness of the religious person, of the covenant person, of the Jew. And notice their particular problem was that they thought they were automatically safe in terms of God's judgment. You see that again in verse 17. So if your Bible's open, Romans 2, verse 17. Indeed... Now, Paul's going to call them by a title that they would have boasted in. It was their pride and joy, this title, Jew. Indeed, you are called a Jew, and you rest on the law and make your boast in God. And Paul is rebuking them because the first reason they thought they were safe is because they had the scriptures. They knew the law. They sang the Psalms, they read the prophets, they taught the words of Isaiah. And they concluded that their Bible knowledge and Bible-shaped morals and practices made them righteous and therefore free from the judgment of God. We saw that this morning, and let me be absolutely clear here again, Paul loves the Scripture. It's not that the Bible is the problem, it's not that the Jews love their Bible too much. No, Paul poured over the Old Testament, and it poured out of him, quite literally. Keep reading his letters, and you'll see Old Testament references everywhere, Old Testament allusions all over the place. He loved the Scripture. He believed that they were, the Scriptures were the inspired Word of God. All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable. 
Oh, he loved the word of God. It's the word of God, the scriptures that make you, Timothy, wise unto salvation. So the Bible's not the problem, but he knew that so many people used the Bible in a problematic way. They used the Bible in such a way that only served to condemn them because they sought to justify themselves through their Bible knowledge and Bible morals. That was the first problem. We mostly confronted that this afternoon. But notice here in our text, Paul, who knows the strategies of of the human heart, he knows where the religious person is going to seek shelter next. They've been beaten back out of the stronghold of scripture knowledge. And so now, Paul knows, they will seek refuge in the next castle. And this castle is the castle of circumcision. And in Paul's day, this was fortress. Uh, So many Jews were hiding themselves in what they thought was the safety of this 25 and beyond, Paul addressed it. Notice verse 25. He's focusing here on circumcision. He says, for circumcision is indeed profitable. Now, what is circumcision? Well, if you were a Jew in Paul's day, circumcision was the most valuable religious symbol you could have. It was a symbol of the covenant relationship, a symbol of being set apart, quite literally cut off from the other nations, cut off from the pagans around them, cut off from the world. The Lord had made a distinction, cut them off, and set them apart for him. And so the Jews saw circumcision as a symbol that was packed full. Yes, even the Jews saw this, packed full of God's grace. They saw that circumcision spoke of the grace of God's free election. Uh, The Lord had chosen pagan Abraham, graciously called him away from idols to come and follow him, and promised to bless the world through him, and circumcision symbolized that. God had graciously called Abraham out of darkness into his marvelous light. He had set him apart and his children apart for himself, and the sign that embodied that, that symbolized that, was Circumcision. It was the sign that said, the almighty, gracious God is in a real relationship with us. And so circumcision was bound up very closely with their sense of identity. This sign tells me I belong to the people of God. And congregation, so far, so good. That's exactly right. God had graciously separated them from the world. He had made a covenant with them, which was a real relationship with them. And this sign was meant to remind them that they belong to the people of God, the covenant people of God. But here's the problem. That was only half the truth. They'd actually set aside the other half and in so doing turned everything on its head. Here's here's what I mean, and then I'll explain this. They had made circumcision itself into a badge of safety. Because they thought like this, I'm circumcised, I'm in covenant with God, therefore God is pleased with me, therefore I'm safe from his judgment, I'm different than the unrighteous world, I'm not like them, I'm safe. In congregation, what Paul is wanting to say here, what he is saying here, is that all of that was soul-destroying presumption. All of it was a mask for hypocrisy and unbelief. And beloved, how many so-called Christians love to hide in this same fortress, whether Reformed or Baptist, Many people turn their baptism into a safety bunker from God's judgment. I'm safe because I was baptized. Look at my baptism. It's my bunker. I'm safe. I'm hiding in there. That's my castle. What's wrong with all this? Well, notice Paul's about to tell us. Look at verse 25. Let's read it in full here. Verse 25. 
He says, for circumcision is indeed profitable. And when Paul says something like that, is indeed profitable, you, you know he's about to turn it on its head and bring it back into the, their face. For, you know, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And so here's the point. Circumcision was a symbol of, yes, being set apart by God. But he, they were set apart for a purpose. They were set apart for God. To be wholly devoted to God, to live for God. Uh, it was a sign that marked out God's people who, yes, were called out of this dark world. But here's the thing. It actually called them to be a new humanity, a new type of holy people, a people utterly cut off from sin and reserved perfectly and permanently for God, which would have then showed itself in perfectly keeping the law. So this good gospel sign carried with it a demand of perfection. And God had made that patently obvious in the Old Testament if they had been reading it carefully. Abraham, walk before me, be blameless. Or Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, listen to this. It couldn't get any clearer than this. Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And the verse ends with the congregation saying, amen, we agree. When really, they ought to be saying what Dr. Vodibakum would say. They ought to be saying, ouch. Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Amen. We can do it. The bloody cutting off of the flesh of the foreskin of an eight-day-old infant was to say, in a powerful way, you and your children aren't innocent in yourself. You aren't blameless. And so, congregation, the first gracious message that they should have grasped from their circumcision is this. My circumcision means that God wants a, a whole cut-off life, a wholly set-apart life, a holy life. He wants a circumcised heart. Not just blameless actions, but a blameless heart. Circumcision was a visible sign pointing to a spiritual internal reality. And so look at verse 28. Paul is saying, here's what it was meant to teach all along. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, or literally by the spirit and not by the letter. And so congregation, what a devastating blow this should have been for a works-based religion. Circumcision, the symbol of it should have been a devastating blow to a works-based religion. And yet many Jewish people completely missed it. And they thought, we have the badge of the covenant, the badge of safety. Thank you, Lord, that we're not like other men like that tax collector over there. And so, congregation, the Jewish people had taken that which was meant to help them see their own sinfulness. And they had turned it into a balm to assure them that they were safe. The Jewish people had taken that which was meant to help them see their own sinfulness and had turned it into a balm to assure them that they were safe. The true message, and it's a gracious message. The true message of circumcision is actually an announcement of how serious their problem is. You need a new heart. Don't think for a minute you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You need a salvation that's gracious from start to finish, that's outside of yourself, coming to you, where you are in your sin and rescuing you. And dear friend, that's actually the first 
sermon that your baptism preaches to you. Have you heard it? It's a sweet, gracious sermon, actually. Because in it, the Lord, the covenant Lord, the Lord who is a God of relationship with sinners is saying, have you yet faced your heart level problem? Let me apply it in a different way. Uh, dear congregation, if you've been baptized, you wear the name of the triune God. Baptized, we saw it this afternoon, into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which means that I am called to represent the triune God in this world. Dear friend, how are you doing? Do you want to hear the first sweet, gracious message of your baptism? Ask yourself that question. How am I doing? Do I represent God beautifully and perfectly in this world? Is all that I do day in, day out, an expression of a heart that's constantly turned Godward? Does this show up then in my costly love for my neighbors? How are we doing? Do my neighbors see through my actions what God looks like? I'm wearing his jersey. Baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do my words, do my actions show off his truthfulness, his patience, his beauty, his kindness, his holiness, his purity. Isn't it true that much more often we are wearing the other team's jersey and reflecting someone very different than God? Now, young friends, here's the thing. God is so gracious That in his kindness, he's giving you baptism so that you might feel something immediately of your failing. Why? Because God wants you to feel like a failure all the time? No. So that you see the depth of your problem. I need heart cleansing. A little bit of fine-tuning of the externals is not going to cut it. A workspace religion, me trying my best all life long, is not going to cut it. He wants you to see your problem so you might cry out to him, that you might look out to him, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's sermon one that your baptism preaches to you every day if you're willing to listen. And that takes us to the second point, or final point, the promise. The promise. And both of these go together. The problem, baptism helps me see the depth of my problem, and baptism is meant to help me hear the promise. Let me finish the sermon title for you, The True Value of Baptism. And I'm saying it's this, The True Value of Baptism is that it is a gospel sign that continually preaches gospel sermons to me. The true value of baptism is that it is a gospel sign that continues to preach gospel sermons to me. It doesn't preach a sermon of presumption. It doesn't preach a gospel of works. It preaches the gospel, a Christ-centered sermon to me every day if I'm willing to listen. A sermon, yes, as we saw in point one, that shows you your need for Christ. You need him. That's what your baptism is telling you. You need a real savior for real sinners. But now in the second point, what we want to hear, what we need to hear is that baptism also shows you the abundant salvation that's found in Christ. Oh, the fullness of of salvation that's found in Christ because in Christ, the triune God has hid all of his riches. And it's all found in the promise. Uh, Look again at Romans 3 now. So if we've been continuing through Romans 2, transition to Romans 3, there's no break of thought, but Romans 3, verse 1, what advantage then has the Jew? 
Or what is the profit of circumcision? I mean, isn't that a good question to ask? Uh, If the Jews' circumcision was calling them to live a perfect life and they're not, what advantage is it? What, maybe that's your question, young friend. What's the, what's the advantage of my baptism? I just feel this weight of, of how I'm failing. I didn't sign up for this. This was put on me from the day I was almost born. What advantage then has the Jew? What pr- is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way. Keep listening. And listen to how Paul answers those questions. Chiefly, because to them were committed the oracles of God. And that word oracles is a word that's used over and over again in Psalm 119 to refer to the word of God or to the promise of God. And so notice what Paul's doing. He's highlighting the promise. And many Jews, they took the sign and they disconnected it from the promise. They took the sign and in so doing, they substituted the true gospel promise with a generic fuzzy presumption. And then they replaced faith in that true gospel promise with their own performance. Me just trying to work it out, I guess, doing my best to please God. And Paul is clarifying all of that, and he's saying the advantage of the covenant member, the advantage of the Jew, the advantage of the covenant member, and the profit of the covenant sign or or of circumcision or baptism, the advantage and the profit is found in the promise. And what was the Old Testament promise, the foundation of all hope? that every Jew who knew their Bible should have grasped. I mean, it's right there on the surface and it's repeated over and over again. It's this, the seed of the woman is gonna crush the head of the serpent. That doesn't, that, that gospel promise which God preached to Adam doesn't sound like you can do it, you're gonna save yourself. The gospel promise is that the seed of the woman, we're we're to look for this child that's going to come to put an end to the hostility between God and us. We have joined Satan's team, and God's going to intervene with this special child to bring us back to him and to crush the enemy. That's that's a God-centered salvation that's all bound up in this seed. And God came with the same gospel and he preached it to Abraham when he saved him. Genesis 15, Abraham believed this promise, verse 6, and was justified, not by working for years, by believing a promise about God sending a human who's going to come and somehow going to bring victory. He's going to conquer our spiritual enemies. And by Abraham believing that promise, he was declared righteous, justified. He was not saved by his works, but he was saved through faith in that coming seed. And then, beloved, remember, God gave Abraham circumcision to help him continue believing in that promise. Because Genesis 16 is Abraham forgetting to believe in that promise and starting to put faith in his own flesh. He takes Hagar to himself, can't can't trust God's promise, going to take Hagar for myself, and we're going to have a child this way, and that'll be the way of salvation. And then God in his loving kindness comes in the next chapter with circumcision. Why? To underscore the gospel. All of your hope, Abraham, is bound up not in you, but in a child that's coming. So cut your foreskin and keep looking for a child who will come and who will save you because you are such a wretch in yourself. You need salvation from the outside and God loves to give it. And so there's this word again, Paul asks, what advantage then has the Jew? That name that the Jewish people love to embrace, that name that symbolized we're set apart for God 
And yet, as we've been seeing, Paul's been exposing them that they actually haven't been living the set-apart life. None of us can in ourselves. And maybe you're then wondering, well, how can we actually fulfill the law? How can we actually be this righteous person who lives that set-apart life? Well, let me tell you the story of the true Jew. The only true Jew. The only faithful Israelite. Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham, circumcised on the eighth day, exiled into Egypt as a young child just to as a pattern of what God's people were exiled in Egypt. He then crossed through the river Jordan. He was baptized in the river Jordan. Again, symbolizing here I am as a representative, as the true Jew, as the seed that was to come. Tempted by Satan in the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and yet faithful. Look at him. Look at this true Jew. He's not grumbling against God. He's not giving in to Satan's temptations. He's not testing God. He's the obedient Israelite. Look at this son. He's wearing the name of the father perfectly. As you look at yourself and you see your failures and how you represent the father to this world, here's the son in the flesh representing God spotlessly to this world. All life long, he lived that set-apart life. He wore the Lord's jersey, as it were. He wore the name of God to represent God, and yet look at him, rejected by his people. Look at him, taken by the Romans, Jew and Gentile, united together in the murder of this man. And that's what we're meant to see in this graphic symbol. Yes, circumcision, a graphic symbol. But here... This isn't just a little water being sprinkled, a little nice water. To It's picturing the blood. It takes us to the real circumcision of Christ, to the cross where his blood was spilt. And so young people, what's the point of your baptism? It's preaching to you gospel sermons. It's saying you're such a mess in yourself, you cannot save yourself. And yet, blood was spilt. And it was spilt for sinners. The just died for the unjust, 1 Peter 3, verse 18, in order to bring us to God. And so circumcision is a gospel sign and seal, not of Abraham's righteousness, but the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. And dear beloved, baptism, now that there's no more need for bloodshed, is the same. But let me say it a little bit clearer, because there's actually more here. God has genuinely received believers and their children into the covenant. And so it is a sign of the covenant of that real relationship. But notice if you go back to our form, it adds circumcision is also a sign of the righteousness that comes by faith. And beloved, what we, our problem is we so often separate the two and we need to bring them back together. Here's what I mean. God has received us into the covenant, yes, so that we might receive Christ by faith. The covenant is meant to, all the promises, all the warmth, all the responsibilities of the covenant is meant to help us believe in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might be saved. And so young people, we can say this, we must say this, God wants you to believe in Christ. That's the message of your baptism. He's so eager. This is his desire that from the youngest days of your life, he's given you this gospel sign and seal to be this, this pressure, as it were, that goes with me through every day of my life. On the one hand, saying I'm a failure in myself, and on the other hand, saying there is one who's faithful, who's never failed, and yet who died for failures, and his name is Jesus Christ, and so believe on him. 
Embrace him as a three-year-old, as a 16-year-old, whatever your age, believe him. And then use your baptism to keep on believing in him. You see how Paul highlights faith? Look at verse 3. Chapter, or verse 1, he asks, what's the benefit of circumcision? Verse 2, he pointed us to the promise of God. And then verse 3, here's the response, the application for all of us. For what if some did not believe? Meaning, faith. Faith in the promise. Faith in Christ. Is what our baptism is for. That's the true value of baptism. It's meant to strengthen our faith in this Jesus. And so it's very much like the word of God that's preached to us. We can hear sermons. We can sit under sermons. We can be flooded with gospel words. And yet listen to Hebrews 4 verse 2. The word was preached to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith. And we can be baptized by the waters. We can be flooded by the waters. We can be sprinkled with the waters. And it might not profit us if we don't receive this Christ by faith. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his own soul? That's the question Jesus asks us. And he asks it to us in love to say, look at how gracious of a savior I am. I want to be front and central in your thoughts. And so there's gospel sermons and there's gospel signs. And I give these not to super strong elite Christians, but I give them to weak, faltering, often faithless believers like Abraham to help them remember that their whole salvation is bound up in me, the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friend, look to the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen.